Thanks very much for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to present to you today on an HIV cure, are we any nearer? So we know from um, numerous case reports that HIV cure is possible. It's rare, but there are multiple examples now of HIV eradication and remission. The first report was in 2009. It was a report of Timothy Ray Brown, who was a man living in Berlin at the time, he had HIV and acute myeloid leukaemia and received a bone marrow transplant. The treatment of the leukaemia from a donor was CCR5 negative. He stopped antiretroviral therapy shortly after and remained HIV free for the next 12 years until he unfortunately passed away in early 2020 as a result of relapse of leukemia. This was the only case report of pure following bone marrow transplantation until 2019, when the reports of Adam Castileo were made public, who also received a bone marrow transplant from a donor who was CCR5 negative. Adam had um, a lymphoma and required a bone marrow transplant for treatment of lymphoma. He's been off treatment now for just on four years with no evidence of recurrence of HIV. So both examples tell us that transplantation with a CCR5 negative bone marrow can cure HIV. It's clearly not possible to use this approach for anyone who does not have cancer. However, it has inspired many new strategies to investigate cure, particularly targeting CCR5. I'll talk about those later on. Just last year, we heard of another pathway to cure. This is Lorraine Willenberg. She's a woman that lives in San Francisco who has never been on antiretroviral therapy and is thought to be an elite controller, naturally controlling her HIV. However, when investigators looked really hard, they actually couldn't find any intact virus, meaning that another pathway to cure could be elimination of all intact virus. How this happens, we don't know. A subsequent case report about to come out in the Annals of Internal Medicine, almost identical report of this time a woman who lives in Esperanza, Argentina. And again, this woman had some virus detected, but all virus detected was defective, not intact. And finally, there's a group of patients who can naturally control HIV after being on treatment for a short period of time. Um, they, uh, this is largely related to their capacity to control the virus. The virus is there at low but detectable levels and is now commonly referred to as post-treatment control. So today I'm going to speak to you about what clinical strategies are being used for an HIV cure and I'm going to specifically discuss recent clinical trials related to latency reversal, combination immunotherapy and gene therapy, which is just about to start in the clinic. And I'm going to talk to you about how we might implement an HIV cure and what we might see in the future. So there are two major forms of HIV infected cells. In the absence of treatment, HIV infects activated CD4 positive T cells, causing productive infection. These cells can be identified because they're DNA positive, they're RNA positive, they express HIV proteins, and they generally don't live and die quite quickly following infection. There's also another form of infection, as there is many different viruses, and this is called latent infection, where the virus integrates into the host genome, usually in resting CD4 T cells, but doesn't complete the viral life cycle. So these cells are DNA positive, RNA negative, and don't express HIV protein. And we now know they're also probably primed to survive. Now, this isn't really binary, meaning you don't just have activated infected cells or productive infection and latent infection. We now know there's probably a spectrum of activity of cells that persist on antiretroviral therapy, ranging from truly latent to cells that do express viral RNA and even some viral proteins and what we now call the active reservoir. So one of the main goals of a, a strategy for an HIV cure. Well, here's the problem, a pool of long-lived and proliferating latently infected cells that contain intact virus, which is replication competent and can emerge from these cells at any time. So one strategy is to completely eliminate every single latently infected cell, essentially what happened with Adam Castileo and Timothy Brown, and this would be called eradication. The other more viable path to an HIV cure is to reduce the amount of latently infected cells 
and enhance the immune control of residual virus, allowing for patients to enter what we would call remission, meaning able to safely stop antiretroviral therapy without virus rebound or being transmitted from one person to another. So strategies to achieve this largely target the virus or the immune system. And there's a whole range of different strategies that have been tested that target the virus, such as very early ART, latency reversal, proapoptotic drugs, immunotoxins, latency silencing, or gene editing. All of this aimed at reducing the pool of latently infected cells. And strategies that target the immune system include broadly neutralizing antibodies, T cell vaccines, immunomodulation, CAR T cells, and also gene editing. And today I'm going to speak to you about, in greater detail, recent studies in the area of latency reversal, in the areas of immunomodulation, and the areas of gene editing. Now, latency reversal has been of high interest for many years. The idea here being to, revert, to um, transform a latently infected cell into a productively infected cell so that it is then visible to the immune system and therefore undergoes cell death. Often this is called shock and kill. And what we've found are that there are many latency reversing agents that can indeed shock the virus, meaning increase HIV transcription. And these are summarised here based on the major classes of drugs that are able to do this. But unfortunately, not many of these interventions actually kill the latently infected cell. Some of these agents have been tested in vivo and clinical trials. These interventions have shown that latency reversing agents can increase viral transcription, however, no decline in the number of infected cells. So a lot of interest now to try and get the kill into shock and kill, say with enhancing the immune response or with the use of pro-apoptotic drugs. And finally, there are some immune modulating latency reversing agents, such as toll light receptor agonists shown here, or anti-PD-1, um, an immune checkpoint blocker um, uh, shown here, which may have dual activity, meaning they can actually reverse latency and potentially enhance immune-mediated clearance. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, SMAC Mimetics, a new class of latency reversing agents, um, the role of TLR agonists, and also some work that we've been doing um, on anti-PD-1. First of all, I'll just say that more drugs is not always better. Several years ago, we demonstrated that disulfiram, a drug used for, for alcoholism, can indeed reverse latency and that potency was greater at a higher dose. Given those findings, um, we then designed a study to test whether combination latency reversal would get a better result. And this Clinical trial was called DIVA, standing for disulfiram and varinostat for HIV latency. Varinostat is a histone decetylase inhibitor and it was previously shown by us and others to also reverse latency in vivo. So in this study, we took people that were living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy with a suppressed viral load for at least three years, and we gave them um, 28 days of high dose disulfiram, that's two grams a day, and just note that the licensed dose is 400 milligrams a day, with intermittent dosing of varinostat, three doses um, early and then three doses late in that 28 day cycle. And this was based on the fact that in vitro, there is additive effects of these two latency reversing agents. Some studies have shown synergism and they work on different pathways. So the first patient was enrolled um, and received um, just on uh, 17 days of disulfiram and two doses of varinostat. However, at the end of the 17th day, he presented with a severe adverse event, um, which was characterized by confusion, lethargy and ataxia. There was some imaging formed, we did actually have some cavernous venous sinus thrombosis, so it was unclear whether that was causing the problem or was related to this intervention. So we decided to continue the clinical trial, but only enrol sequential additional patients and to watch closely. And participant two received just 11 days of disulfiram with three doses of varinostat, and almost the identical adverse event recurred, leading to cessation of this study. And after further reading in relation to the effects of disulfiram, we believe that this most likely was related to 
the high doses of dosulfiram that have been associated with neurotoxicity. Now, interestingly, when we looked at cell-associated unspliced HIV RNA, which is a marker of tra HIV transcription, you can see in participant one, the grey boxes indicate disulfiram, the red lines that are in a state, and you can see quite significant increase in cell-associated RNA consistent with latency reversal really in both participants. However, clearly this combination is not suitable to be investigated further. The other um, new class of drugs that there's quite a lot of interest in is SMAC Mimetics. These have been developed for cancer to inhibit proteins that inhibit apoptosis. So they're actually pro-apoptotic drugs. They also activate a particular transcription factor called NF-kappa B, which means, and NF-kappa B is a very important um, driver of HIV transcription. And studies, at least in animal models, have shown that these drugs activate latency in both blood and tissue with minimal toxicity. And this just shows you the results of a study in non-human primates who are on antiretroviral therapy. And then when they re receive this particular SMAC mimetic AZD558, you can see these multiple blips of viral HIV RNA in plasma consistent with latency reversal. And this was also demonstrated to occur in tissue um, sections, particularly lymph node. No clinical trials have yet proceeded with SMAC mimetics to determine the effects in humans. And finally, visitolomod um, is a TLR7 agonist, and there's high interest in this compound um, for HIV cure. Visitolomod is a TLR7 agonist, and it's now being used in multiple combination HIV cure studies. This is because of activity as a latency reversing agent shown in vitro and also some non-human primates. In one non-human primate study, a TLR agonist, or specifically visitolomod, together with combinations of HIV antibodies actually cured 50% of the animals. So very high interest in whether this compound could be used in humans. The first clinical trial of isotolamide in people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy was reported just last year. It was double-blind placebo-controlled trial. This drug was safe with minor adverse events. And there was clear immune-enhancing effects at um, doses greater than four milligrams. Um, and it's shown here, here's vesitolomod at eight milligrams. You can see after the first, fifth and tenth dose, significant increases in IL-1 receptor, IP-10 and ITAC. And these are all um, inflammatory molecules that are dependent on interferon. However, in this particular trial, there was no evidence of latency reversal. And finally, these are the um, monkey studies that have really given um, hope that in combination immunotherapy could work. These are combinations of TLR7 agonists with antibodies or with vaccine with um, or without very early treatment of anti with antiretroviral therapy. And these combination studies are now just going into the clinic in um, humans. I'm going to switch tack now and talk about immunomodulation and specifically the role of immune checkpoints and HIV cure. So immune checkpoints such as PD-1 or CTLA-4 dampen, are expressed on T cells and they dampen the immune response by binding to their ligands expressed on dendritic cells. So here you can see PD-1 bound to PD-L1 or PD-L2, therefore blocking the um, response of the T cell. And then you have um, CTLA-4, which um, is bound to its ligand CD80 and CD86. Now, for many years, we've known that PD-1 and CTLA-4 are increased on both CD4 and CD8 T cells in people with HIV, whether they're on treatment or off treatment. We also know that latent HIV is actually enriched in PD-1 positive cells in blood and lymph nodes and people on antiretroviral therapy. And in both PD-1 positive and CTLA-4 positive cells in non-human primates on antiretroviral therapy. And the thinking is that um, the expression of these exhaustion markers actually put the brakes on HIV replication, just like those markers put the brakes on a T cell response. And there's been case reports of people receiving anti-PD-1, particularly people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy who have cancer, and following anti-PD-1, there's been a decline in infected cells or a clearance of the reservoir in some, but not all case reports. 
So we had the opportunity to study the effects of these immune checkpoint blockers in people living with HIV who had cancer and received either PD-1 alone, anti-PD-1 alone, or anti-PD-1 in combination of anti-CTLA-4. This was a virology sub-study of a multi-site, non-randomised phase one clinical trial of these two antibodies in a um, network in the US called the AIDS Malignancy Consortium, or AMC095. And the participants received up to 92 weeks of treatment depending on the anti-tumor response. And we investigated the effects on reversing HIV latency in 40 of the participants. And what we found was that following anti-PD-1 together with anti-CTLA-4, we saw a median fold increase in cell-associated unspliced HIV RNA the marker of HIV transcription of 1.44 fold after the first infusion and 2.5 fold after four infusions. So clearly evidence of latency reversal. When we looked at the size of the latent reservoir, the frequency of latently infected cells, we couldn't do this on everyone because you need a very large amount of blood to determine what we call the IUPM, or infectious units per million. This is a viral outgrowth assay where you see the frequency of cells with replication competent virus. You can see here in the eight patients we could assess this who received anti-PD-1 alone, there really was no change in the frequency of infected cells. However, in the two participants, and of course this is a limited number, we did actually see a very significant, it did see a, a, a clear decline in the frequency of infected cells in the participants that received both antibodies. Now using anti-CTLA-4 is really not a viable option in people living with HIV given its toxicity, but there's a lot of work now happening to look at different types of dosing of anti-PD-1 or combining anti-PD-1 with other interventions to clear or reduce the reservoir. We also looked at the effects of anti-PD-1 on the immune response to controlling HIV. And we did these experiments together with Afam Okoyu and Lewis Picker in Portland, Oregon. And we did these in the non-human primate model. And basically what Afam and Lewis did was they took monkeys, they infected the monkeys with a version of SIV, put those monkeys on antiretroviral therapy, and it's possible to achieve full suppression. The monkeys were then given either a control antibody, shown here in black, or anti-PD-1 prior to and following the cessation of antiretroviral therapy or just following cessation of antiretroviral therapy. We're trying to work out um, how long the anti-PD-1 needed to be given for and if you needed antigen present, meaning a rebound virus to stimulate the immune response. So I'm going to show you the results. Um, in blue is the control antibody, in red is early anti-PD-1, and green is late anti-PD-1. And we measured two things. We first of all measured the time to viral rebound. So after stopping antiretroviral therapy, did the intervention delay the time for virus to come back? And this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, clearly showing no difference if you gave PD-1 or not. We then looked at the viral load after viral rebound or the set point to see if the monkeys were able to control virus better in the presence of anti-PD-1. And indeed they were. In blue shows you viral rebound in the monkeys that received the control antibody. And in red and green, no difference early or late anti-PD-1. You had a reduction of about two logs of virus viral load. So clearly anti-PD-1 greatly enhanced immune control of viral replication. Whether this was mediated through enhanced T cell function, we don't know, but suspect that was the case. And this really is encouraging for potentially future studies in um, people living with HIV. Obviously, we need to get better control than just a two log reduction, but we can clearly show an effect. And recently, there's a really interesting paper, public, um, um, presentation made at the recent IAS meeting in 2021, looking at the effects of anti-PD-1 with anti-IL-10. IL-10 is an immunosuppressive cytokine, so anti-IL-10, again, will enhance the HIV-specific T-cell response. And in this study, the um, investigators looked at um, monkeys that just received a vehicle control, monkeys that received anti-IL-10 alone, or monkeys that received anti-IL-10 with anti-PD-1 shown here in blue. All monkeys were infected with virus, placed on antiretroviral therapy, and then antiretroviral therapy was stopped in what's called an ATI, or antiretroviral treatment interruption. 
And again, they looked at time to viral load and um, the set point after antiretroviral therapy was stopped. And the results are very interesting. You can see here that all monkeys rebounded in the control group and the set point was quite high viral load of about 10 to the five copies per mil. Anti-IL-10 didn't make too much of a difference, but you can see there were some monkeys that were able to control their virus better. So when you put anti-IL-10 together with anti-PD-1, you could see that the set point was really substantially reduced by these two interventions. When I now switch to the third strategy I want to talk about, which is gene therapy. Gene therapy can be used in, a mul in multiple different ways in cure strategies. First of all, Gene therapy can be used to attack the virus. It can be used to enhance anti-HIV immune responses. Gene therapy can be used to protect cells from becoming infected. In other words, engineering uninfected cells to be resistant to HIV, essentially through knocking out CCR5, imitating what happened to Timothy Brown and Adam Castileo. And finally, gene therapy can be used to purge or directly eliminate the virus itself by designing the gene scissors to target HIV sequences and remove the provirus. Now, delivery of gene therapy is probably the biggest major challenge currently. Currently, most gene therapy trials require ex vivo editing, meaning that cells are removed from the body, edited, and then reinfused back. But there are significant advances now in using in vivo gene editing, which would make a very big difference in capacity to deliver these interventions. So the first reports of ex vivo gene therapy were done by eliminating CCR5. They were reported back in 2014. And here, people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy underwent leukapheresis. Large amounts of PBMC were um, collected. CD4 T cells were isolated. And then here they use zinc finger nucleases to edit or remove the CCR5 gene. The CCR5 negative cells were then expanded ex vivo and then reinfused. Now these trials were safe, showed there were no adverse effects. The CCR5 negative cells were detected following reinfusion, but at quite low levels of about 6%. Now more recently, there's been further work done using this approach, but in this study, participants received ex vivo CCR5 modified cells, but also had um, some conditioning treatment with cyclophosphamide to enhance engraftment. And they underwent a treatment interruption, and this shows the time since treatment interruption and the proportion of people that were suppressed. Mm -hmm. And here, the, where they used historical controls, important to, make, to um, make that really clear from other studies from the AIDS clinical trials group um, from 93 participants and compared the time to rebound or the proportion of people that remain suppressed without CCR5 modification and with CCR5 modification. You can see there was a significant delay in time to viral load rebound after interruption of ART, which is encouraging. But I think what's most exciting is these advances using in vivo gene therapy. So we now have the capacity to deliver gene modifying tools in vivo through either nanoparticle delivery or a vector. This is adeno associated virus, which can deliver the, very, the particular DNA um, allowing for production of the gene of interest in vivo. And this has actually already been done in HIV by delivering the DNA for particular monoclonal antibodies. One trial that used AAV1 to deliver the antibody PG9 and another trial that um, delivered um, VRCO7 and showed again that it was safe that antibodies continue to be produced over a prolonged period of time. Really very exciting work. And in other areas of medicine, we've learned that we can deliver gene editing tools here, particularly CRISPR-Cas9, and I'm sure many people know about Cas9 is a DNA editing nuclease, and with the right guide RNA, you can target this gene editing nuclease to your gene of interest, shown here in orange, leading to cleavage of the gene you want to destroy. There's been some recent advances of delivering CRISPR-Cas9 in vivo, actually using lipid nanoparticles. So exactly the same technology as all the mRNA vaccines we're learning about, but not but delivering mRNA for CRISPR-Cas9, not mRNA for spike protein. And this was just recently shown to be successful using for gene editing of a rare form of amyloidosis. 
Now, investigators have tried this in monkey models of SIV, delivering CRISPR-Cas9 to edit SIV proviral DNA. In this particular study in monkeys, a small study of only eight monkeys, there were ex vivo gene editing performed first, followed by in vivo gene editing, and then assessment of whether SIV DNA had been destroyed or reduced with this intervention, which it did in a monkey model. And in fact, as a result of this, excision biotherapeutics, who are now developing this approach, have recently been approved to have the first inhuman phase one, two trial to evaluate the safety, tolerability and efficacy of CRISPR-Cas9, what they call EBT101, targeting HIV. It will be delivered using the adeno-associated virus, as I showed you earlier, not lipid nanoparticles, and it will be delivered with two guide RNAs to recognise HIV. So it's really exciting advance, and we'll hear more about that in coming months. Finally, should we ever be successful for a cure, how are we ultimately going to implement that? And to get the IAS, the International AIDS Society, has been doing a lot of work trying to develop a target product profile for an HIV cure. And that means extensive discussions with community groups, with researchers, with regulators and pharmaceutical companies to design what we think success would look like, what would be the minimal or optimal combination for an HIV cure. This work's been published um, in Lancet HIV, but I'll just highlight a few things that came out from this um, analysis. First of all, target population initially for cure research is adults on stable ART with HIV RNA less than 200 copies per mil and high CD4 counts because people think that's the most likely situation you'll get success. What is, um, what is success with, a cure, with cure? What would what do people think is effective enough to continue doing this? And the agreement was that HIV RNA less than 200 copies per mil for at least two years off antiretroviral therapy is effective in at least 20% of individuals and the average relapse rate was less than 10% per year. This is worth pursuing. And finally, a lot of discussion on safety and tolerability. There's very little tolerance for severe adverse events, but grade three reversal adverse events could be acceptable dependent on clinical efficacy. Um, and uh, one, and, and that makes sense. If you're going to have an efficacious intervention, you may be willing to um, tolerate higher adverse events. So here we are now with HIV treatment. We have widespread availability of oral antiretroviral therapy and just emerging long-acting antiretroviral therapy, at least in some countries. Soon we'll probably have broadly neutralizing antibodies, an alternative to antiretroviral therapy. And eventually we hope that we will one day see cure modalities. Most likely the first cure modality that could be rolled out would be target of HIV remission with combination immunotherapy. Maybe ex vivo cures could be delivered with gene or cellular therapy. And really ultimately, if gene therapy was to work, ideally we would like that in an in vivo setting. And ultimately the holy grail would be a single shot cure for everyone. So in summary, latency reversal will likely be needed as part of a cure strategy. Latency reversal alone doesn't reduce the reservoir and there's still a lot of work to be done to develop less toxic and more potent drugs. Immune checkpoint blockade is being actively pursued as a strategy to reverse HIV latency and also enhance immunity, but there are still some concerns around safety, so dosing will be very important. There's some optimism for gene therapy, including strategies to attack protect and purge the virus using both ex vivo and now in vivo delivery. And this field is moving at a very rapid rate with really high potential for benefits in the HIV cure space. And finally, although we really still remain far from a cure for HIV, we now know that it's important to have active discussions about a target product profile to ensure that any advance that's made will be delivered quickly to those at highest need and with a modality, with an intervention that's acceptable to the community. I'd like to acknowledge the many people that um, are, I've worked with in my laboratory. In particular, I've shown you results of some of the work that we've done recently using disulfiram and varinostat, um, work led by Thomas Rasmussen and James McMahon, um, work on immune checkpoint blockers and, um, and, and anti-PD-1, particularly work we've done with Afro McCoy and Lewis Picker 
And then I'd like to acknowledge all our finding agencies, particularly the NHMRC, um, the NIH and AMFA. Thanks very much.